Okay, I am going to, uh, I'm going to need a little help. Tom, how are your basketball skills? Horrible. Horrible. Okay, uh, let's see. Need someone else. Ed, you're an athlete. How are your basketball skills? <laughs> Better than Tom's? We'll see. Okay, well, um, man, I should have, had, should have had someone else sitting up. Colton, how are your basketball skills? Terrible. <laughs> Better than Tom's? Yeah. Better than Ed's? How about we just fake it? Tell you what, could you just sit right here just for about, about five minutes and just, I just need a rebounder who will just help me um, because you're all going to see how terrible my basketball skills are as well. Okay, so um, any basketball fans in the house? Okay, several. Se- Randy, you, sh- I, you should be my, you're the basketball coach. Anyways, we got Colt. All right, he's going to be great. So if you watch basketball, you don't even have to be a basketball fan to know that the most common method or way of shooting a basket is the overhand push shot, right? We cheer and we teach our kids, you take your dominant hand, you put it behind the ball, you take your other hand to the side of the ball, up, flick the wrist, swishes in, beautiful. Unless you're LeBron James and somebody pushes you with their pinky finger and then you fall, it's really bad, you get a foul out of it. All right. <laughs> Did you know, though, that that is not the only way to shoot a basketball? That there is another style and method of shooting a basketball. Anybody else? Anybody know what it is? It's the what? It's the granny shot. That's right. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. There are two ways to shoot a basketball. You will almost never see anyone shoot granny style unless they just absolutely cannot do the common push style. But did you know that there was a research project several years ago in which they took a bunch of kids who were not necessarily strong athletes and they divided them into two groups and taught them basketball. Group number one, they taught the common overhead throw and group number two, they taught the granny throw. Guess what? After a couple of weeks of training and practice, which group shot had a higher percentage of free throws? You guys are so smart. You can see where this is going. Those who shot granny style had a higher percentage of free throws. They also discovered that not only did they have a higher percentage, but they improved and improved their percentage and increased their percentages faster. Did you also know that then when they went and talked to a physics expert who who, uh, who analyzed it from the perspective of physics, he suggested that the style of shooting the ball from lower and the arc and the angle and all the other factors that go into the physics of it suggest that the granny style uh, style increases the odds of a free throw going into the basket. Did you also know Wilt Chamberlain, in his record-setting 100-point game in 1962, although he was typically not a very good free-throw shooter, in that game, he shot his free-throws, granny-style, making 28 out of 32. So obviously, with that kind of success, he kept it up afterwards, right? No. Why not? So we have the physics expert who says that's the preferable way. We have the research study, and we have a hero in the game showing that it actually works. And yet, almost nobody uses the obvious, better way of shooting. Why not? It's dorky. (laughs) It's just not cool. I think we owe a big apology to grannies everywhere. (laughs) Interestingly enough, one more case in which you should have listened to your grandma's wisdom. Not only is grandma wise in almost every area of life, but even her basketball skills are superior. (laughs) Why don't we do it? Because of pride. And here's what we know. Colton, thanks. You can go sit wherever you want. Take the basketball if you want. Yep, set it there. If I give it up here, it's going to roll all over the place. And Here's what we know about truth. Truth is true regardless of whether you believe it or not. But truth doesn't really make a difference in your life until you believe it. You can believe that granny style shooting is a preferable and better method of shooting and that it will raise your free throw percentage. 
But that will not make a difference in your life just because you believe it until you take the ball and actually humble yourself to shoot with the different way of shooting. You, you can be really super thirsty, and I can offer you a glass of water, but until you receive the glass of water and take a drink, until you believe that the water will, will, will quench your thirst enough to receive it from me, to trust it, and to put it into action, the water will do nothing until you drink it, and then when it, you do, then it refreshes you. Truth is true regardless of whether you believe it, but... The truth will not benefit you until you believe it, receive it, and then it makes a difference in your life. In these middle chapters of the Gospel of John, what we find, we said last week, is that Jesus is not so much arguing about the truth anymore. He's not so much debating the truth anymore. But now, Jesus is interacting with regular old people like you and I. And as they believe the truth and receive the truth, it's changing their lives. As the man last week, the, the man who was born blind and had, had lived his whole life in blindness, when he believed Jesus and trusted Jesus, and trusted in Jesus' healing power, then his life was changed, his sight was restored, and he believed and believed the truth of Jesus, his life was changed, and he experienced the benefits. What we're seeing now is that people are believing the truth of Jesus, and it is changing the trajectory of their lives, literally. So here's the story that we find in chapter 11. There's a man named Lazarus. He is friends with Jesus. Jesus spends time at Lazarus' house um, along with Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. They live just outside of Jerusalem. And so when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, which usually means conflict and arguing and debating, and it's not an easy place for Jesus to hang out, just outside the city, the home of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, was Jesus' hangout place. These were the friends who were life-giving to him. When he hung out with them, that he enjoyed that time. They were friends. And so, when Lazarus becomes deathly ill, people send a messenger to Jesus, his friend, because Jesus can heal people. They send the messenger and they say, Lazarus, uh, Jesus, Lazarus, your friend, is deathly ill. Jesus has healing power because he's the son of God. And so what does Jesus do? He rushes to the side of his friend Lazarus or he sends a message saying, he's going to be healed, I declare it. No, he does nothing. He sits on it for two more days. They're like, Jesus, this is your friend. Aren't you going to go heal him? He's been getting worse and worse and worse by the day. Jesus, go heal your friend. Why aren't you healing your friend? Jesus, come on. He sits on it, does nothing. Finally, after enough time has passed, what we discover is that Jesus is going to, he has purposely allowed some time to pass because he wants to help his disciples believe. Here's what we discover in John chapter 11, verse 14, which is kind of where we're going to pick it up. So then he told them, his own disciples, very plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And so he waits purposely two days until Lazarus passes so that what his disciples see and what the people see will help them to believe. Interestingly enough, if you have ever struggled to believe and if you have felt like people have pressured you to make a quick decision, all or nothing to believe in Jesus, what we discover is that over the course of three years, Jesus is still taking time to help his disciples believe. He's helping them to grow in their belief until they are fully, absolutely convinced. And he says, I did this on purpose because I want I want to help you believe. I want you to become fully convinced. I know that it doesn't happen all in a minute. And so Jesus makes a journey, and he, and, he, and he journeys to the village where they are. And when he gets there, Lazarus's probably oldest sister runs out to meet him, and she says, Jesus, if you would have been here, Lazarus would not have died. Interesting how she approaches like, she has enough faith that Jesus can heal Lazarus when he's sick, but now, well, we all know, death is the end of all things. It's the great enemy. It is the one thing that even in modern medicine that we have not been able to figure out, we're not even close to conquering, and that is the great mystery, the great unknown, the great, uh, the, the great pain of human reality, and that is death. And she's like, Jesus, you have healing power. You could have healed him when he was sick. Now that he's dead, well... Not even you have the healing power to do that, Jesus, because that's obviously the one thing that you cannot do. You would have got here. Instead of waiting around for two couple of days, he could be healed. 
Jesus says, I tell you the truth, he's going to live. And she says, okay, I know, I know. I, I understand, Jesus. I believe, like, in the resurrection. Okay? I, I, I believe, well, I believe that there's this life for sure, and I believe that there's another future life out there in the future sometime. Who knows when it's going to be, what it's really going to happen. We've heard this idea of the resurrection. There's ample evidence of it in the Old Testament that I believe that God's going to come back and resurrect in heaven. And it's going to be different and weird and spirits. I don't really know, but I mean, I know he's going to like live again, but that doesn't really do us any good right now. And he says, you believe in this thing called the resurrection? Let me tell you some truth. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And so the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives their life by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? We've said this whole series, the most important thing you can understand about truth is that truth is not just an idea. Truth is not just a, a series of statements that you check off the box and say, yes, I believe, yes, I believe, yes, I believe, sign your name, and now you're good to go with the truth. No, that truth is more than that, that the truth is a person. And when we stop seeing the truth as an idea or a philosophy or a, buck, or a checklist of statements, but seeing the truth as, an, as, as a person, that the truth is the person of Jesus Christ, and we pursue Jesus while we are pursuing truth, it changes everything. Jesus says the resurrection is not just an idea out there somewhere that might kind of happen, but it's all cloaked in mystery. No, he says, I am the resurrection. It's all about me. And I am the resurrection. If you believe in the resurrection, you just look to me, and then you'll understand the resurrection. I am the resurrection, and I am life. We read this earlier in the book of John. He says, I actually created the world. I created life. You have life, Jesus says, because I gave it to you. And if I gave you life the first time around, I'm going to give you life, and I can give you life the second time around. I am the resurrection. I am life. Do you believe, in other words, do you believe that I have mastery over life and death? And she says, verse 27, Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Do you realize how big of a statement that is? There's other stories about Mary and Martha, and a lot of times Martha gets a bad rap because she's just a little bit uptight. But look at this beautiful statement of faith. Yes, I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you're the Savior. I believe you are the Son of God of God. Everybody's been talking about it. You've been hinting at it. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you are the Son of God who is to come into the world, who was sent by God, who will be sent by God. Yes, I believe in you. And Jesus says that makes a difference. That resurrection life starts now. Eternal life is not just something that's out there in the future. Eternal life starts now. And Jesus says, when you live your life by believing in me, it changes how you live your life because actually eternal life starts right now. And you start living your life in me, and then when your time on earth pass, is, is over, you transition into eternal life with me. And when resurrection comes, I will raise you up. You'll get a resurrected body like my resurrected body, and then you'll, we'll see each other face to face. And it's all just one long process that starts right now. It's not just like there's life here that we know about, and then the great mystery, who knows what that's going to be. Jesus says, I know I'm in charge of it. I have mastery over life and death. Do you believe? And she says, yes. And then Jesus goes the extra step and he says, now I want to prove it to you. I want to affirm to you that everything you just said is correct. I want to affirm to you that yes, I am the master over life and death. Now that you've affirmed it and you said you believe it, let me show it to you. And then the most amazing thing happens. He proves it. Check this out. Play the video. She saw him. She fell at his feet. Lord, if you had been. 
been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her weeping, and he saw how the people with her were weeping also. His heart was touched, and he was deeply moved. Have you buried him? Come and see, Lord. Jesus wept. See how much he loved him, the people said. But some of them said, He gave sight to the blind man, didn't he? Could he not have kept Lazarus from dying? Deeply moved once more, Jesus went to the tomb, which was a cave with a stone placed at the entrance. Take the stone away. There will be a bad smell, Lord. He has been buried four days. Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? took the stone away. <coughs> Jesus looked up. I thank you, Father, that you listen to me. I know that you always listen to me. But I say this for the sake of the people here so that they will believe that you sent me. After he had said this, he called out in a loud voice. Lazarus! Come out! and feet wrapped in grave clothes and with a cloth round his face. Untie him and let him go. Okay. Now, if I'd have made the video, and if I was the director, there'd be a whole lot more celebrating going on, right? I, I'll admit, it's just a little bit underwhelming. In fact, if you're watching um, the, the, the Chosen series online, which you haven't, if you haven't seen it, you should. It's amazing. I'll, I'll give it full endorsement, right? And I rarely full endorse Bible movies, but uh, you should watch it. I can't wait until we get to this episode here. They're going to do a lot better job, I'm pretty sure. That's going to be a full-on party. Why? Because they have been crying their eyes out for four days. Lazarus is gone, and they're frustrated with Jesus, and now they see him walk out of the tomb, and he's alive again. I don't think Jesus is like, hey, you might want to take the grave clothes off. No, I think he's like, get over there, take the grave clothes off. Come on, let, we're singing, we're dancing. Let's go and have a party. He is back to life again. They are celebrating, right? Because the truth gives life. Look, look what happened, okay? Look, look at this, verse, verse 45, okay? Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. 
They said, look, we know that Lazarus has been dead. Like, this is not a trick. This is not just a scheme. Nobody's trying to get one over on us. Like, we know. We have seen her pain. They have been crying and weeping and mourning now for four days, and now he's back alive. Okay, Jesus, you've proved it. We will believe you are the truth, and they, they trust in him. And here's what we know. When you believe the truth, all of a sudden you get all of the benefits of the truth, and the truth becomes real, and it literally changes the trajectory of your life. I mean, especially for Lazarus, right? Significantly changed the trajectory of his life and all those around him. And Jesus says, remember what I said about resurrection? It's going to be like what you just experienced with Lazarus, except for most of us, there's going to be a lot more than four days. There may be four decades or 400 years. The time isn't really going to matter because when Jesus calls your name and you've been a dead and dead in the Lord and it is time for resurrection, how long you've been dead won't really matter, but it is going to be a celebration that the truth gives life. Lazarus is back from the dead and they are celebrating. But not everybody. Look at verse 46. Got a whole bunch of people. They're all of a sudden believing in Jesus, but now, verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees, and they told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees, they called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Then the Romans will come, will take away both our temple and our nation. And then one of them, in Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. In other words, in about a couple of weeks, he is going to go into the temple and offer the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. He spoke up. You know nothing at all. You don't realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and to make them one. And so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Now, don't miss it there. John says, hey, he didn't realize what he was saying, but he was actually prophesying the death of Jesus and that Jesus would die for many. But just because he's prophesying doesn't make it okay what he did. Do you realize what he says? He's the leader, and he stands up, and he says, it's time for Jesus to go. Kill him. And even though that's a prophecy of what's going to happen, that doesn't make it okay to make the decision, because God uses a lot of people with wrong motives to get his work done. And he says, kill him. And from that day on, do you catch this? From that day on, they plotted to take his life. Oh, there's been some times so far where they've, in the moment, they've gotten really mad and they've tried to kill him, tried to injure him, and Jesus is like, nope, not time yet, so I'm just going to like make my way out of this. But at this point, they are like, okay, we're going to look for an opportunity. We're going to plot. We're going to scheme. We're going to think. We're going to find alliances. We're going to figure out how to make this happen. And their life becomes plotting to take Jesus' life. Here's the deal. If the truth gives life, then untruth takes life. If the truth gives life, then rejecting the truth is a path of taking life, literally killing the truth because Jesus is the truth. And now, by rejecting the truth, they're making an effort to kill the truth. And so Jesus has to stay away from Jerusalem. And we don't really know for how long, but it says at this time he's going to stay out of Jerusalem because it's not yet time. And Jesus is not going to let his life be taken until it is time. It's not yet time. And so Jesus stays in rural areas until he is ready to lay down his life. So fast forward. We're not really sure how long, but fast forward up until about one week before he will be crucified. And Jesus says, it's time. Chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. Okay, catch this. Oh, this is awesome. This is amazing. Where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Uh, Yeah, we're still celebrating, right? Jesus is back in town. We're celebrating. We're having a dinner. We're throwing a feast. We didn't have time. That was an impromptu party last time. Now's the big formal party, and everybody's invited. We got the best of everything. We're having a dinner in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary, oh, look at this, Mary, the sister of Lazarus. 
Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, and she wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. What do we see here? We see an extravagant love for Jesus. What we see here is a beautiful scene of worship. Here she is worshiping Jesus, who we believe is the truth. We see someone pursuing God passionately. We see someone loving Jesus recklessly. Why? Because she dared to break the custom, the the cultural tradition of letting another man see her hair. She takes her head covering off and she wipes Jesus with her hair and she shows her head in public. which was a cultural disgrace, but she doesn't care. That's what Jesus deserves, and she loves him recklessly. Some even said it was foolishly because of the amount of money that she spent, and Jesus says, no, she she is worshiping here. The truth gives life, and it is beautiful. This is a worship service you and I wish we could be a part of. I believe these are the kind of worship services we're gonna enjoy in heaven with these and other glorious acts of worship of Jesus, the King of kings, the truth. The truth is beautiful. Untruth is ugly. Look at the last words that come right after this, verse 10. Oh, sorry, verse 9, verse 9. Meanwhile, while this whole gathering with Jesus, the party, Mary worshiping, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews, they found out that Jesus was there and they came, not only because of him, but they came to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And what happens when people come and they see and they hear Jesus? They say, we believe. You're the truth. You are the truth we've been waiting for. You're the son of God. We believe and their lives are changed. The trajectory of their life has changed. They see Lazarus. They're celebrating. They're worshiping Jesus. But... If the truth is beautiful, untruth and rejecting the truth is ugly. Killing the truth is ugly. Look at verse 10. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. What? What? We're killing Lazarus as well? I I thought just one person had to die. That's what the chief priest said, right? But evidently now, that's not enough. Now we're going to kill someone else. Who else are we going to kill? Killing everybody up in here. You believe in Jesus? You're gone too. You, be careful. You're gone. You, gone. You, dead. Kill them all. Like, when does this craziness end? It doesn't. The truth is beautiful. Rejecting the truth is ugly. The truth gives life. Untruth takes it away. So we read right here, and I mean, we're, we're, we're like torn. There's these really beautiful celebrations of life and worship and trust and believing. And there's these really ugly, dark conversations of killing the truth, plotting. And if you can imagine, there's hearts living in light and there are hearts living in darkness. So let's get really, really practical. What does this mean for us? What it means is that the stakes for truth are high. And just like we can read in back into the story, and if we had to pick one of these settings to be in, we would definitely want to enjoy the Jesus truth setting. It's just more fun. None of us would want to be a part of those religious leaders' conversations where there's plotting and more and more people are dying. And everybody's hated. Those conversations were filled with ugliness, with complaining, arguing, bitterness. None of us would choose to be in that group. Here's what gets real for us. And yet, how often in our own lives do we choose to reject the truth and walk in a place of darkness by killing the truth? Because just as like it was true for them, it's true for us that wherever and whenever we are denying the truth, avoiding the truth, rejecting the truth, killing the truth, that is a path of darkness and pain 
and bitterness. And no, I don't think it's going to lead you to a path of literally killing people. You'll kill off some really good relationships. You make enough compromises with the truth that seem like just little white lies or little compromises, and pretty soon you'll be making big, giant compromises. You'll lose friends. You'll lose family. You'll lose really important relationships. That's just the path of denying the truth. And these guys here show us the end of that path. It's a darkness that you don't want to go towards. So let's ask the question today. Here's the really practical question. I hate to leave us with this, this kind of negative light, but I mean, that's just where the story leads us, okay? How do I know if I'm killing the truth in my life? Well, the first question is, where's Jesus in your life? And you know me, I'm not a high-pressure salesman, but, but like if Jesus is the truth, then the most important starting point of seeking the truth and making sure that you're embracing the truth is to answer the question, who is Jesus in your life? And I would encourage you to do everything you can to learn more about Jesus, to seek Jesus, and to do what you can to come to a point of believing in Jesus and trusting him in your life. Because as we know, that when you choose to believe, that activates his truth in your life, and that's what changes the trajectory of your life. The biggest, single, most important question you've got to answer for your life is not what your career will be, not who you will marry, how many kids you will have, where you will live, all those. Those are all important issues. The most important life trajectory changing decision you will make in your life is who is Jesus for you? And you settle that question in terms, and you answer it, Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the Savior, my Savior. Jesus is the Son of God, and I'm going to worship him as the Son of God. That changes your life. You line up with truth. If you're not there yet, that's your number one job before the next question we're going to ask is to investigate Jesus. We've got some really great resources to help you with that. Text us, let us know if we can help you in your journey to really investigate Jesus and know who Jesus is in your life. And then, for a whole bunch of the people in the crowd in the room today, even watching online, who settled the question of who Jesus is in your life, look, just because you believe in Jesus does not make you immune from untruth. We said the last couple of weeks ago that this, our spiritual enemy, he's a really good liar and deceiver, and he works even to deceive those who believe and trust in Jesus. So how do I know if I'm denying the truth? Well, let's just look really quickly at the, the conversation of those religious leaders. Here's how their argument went. Okay, look at verse 48. If we let Jesus go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. That was their final justification for killing Jesus. If we don't stop this, everyone will believe in Jesus. In other words, we will lose our popularity. The Romans will come and take away our temple and our town. We will lose our position. We have a temple, therefore we have a position, and we have some power. And if we lose the temple, we lose our power. If we don't stop Jesus, we're going to lose our popularity. We're going to lose our power, and we'll lose our position. The Romans will come. They'll destroy our city. Do you see here, and this is really important for our time, okay? Do you see here their obsession with politics over faithfulness to the truth of God? They're more concerned about, they're not even asking the God question here. They're focused on the politics question. And I know, followers of Jesus, we need to be engaged in politics. But po politics never supersede our faithfulness to Jesus. And they've forgotten all about God so that they can retain power, position, and popularity. And when their popularity, their position, and their power is threatened, they're willing to take Jesus out. How do I know when I'm denying the truth? When I'm feeling that my popularity is threatened. 
I will be tempted to deny the truth, to keep it. When I'm feeling that whatever position and power I might have is being threatened, then I am susceptible to temptation to deny the truth, to hold on for all it's worth. Maybe you can even see it. Here's what we discovered. The truth gives life. Untruth takes it away. I've discovered that when I'm living with an open-handed posture of giving, of serving, of loving, that's beautiful, usually in line with the truth. When I am living closed-fisted, keeping, defending, grasping, holding on to power, popularity, prestige, pride, whatever it may be. Be careful. In those moments, we will deny and kill the truth. How do I know if I am killing the truth? What does Jesus say about it? And how am I responding? Open-handed or closed-fisted? Two of the indicators of how you are responding to the truth. Here's what we know. You start making little compromises with the truth and it leads you down a dark road. Jesus, Jesus, we don't want to go down that dark road. Jesus, we want to live by the truth. We want to believe the truth. Jesus, we know that the truth gives life, and we want to live in life, and we want to be able to give life to the people around us. So Jesus, would you show us if there's any area in our lives where we are denying and killing the truth. Lord, I pray that you would show us today, is there any area in our lives where we are avoiding the truth? Jesus, where is pride ruling in our hearts? Where's popularity winning in our hearts? Lord, where am I grasping for power and position and missing out on the truth? Jesus, we so desperately want the truth to reign in our lives. if for no other reason, because it is life-giving. So Jesus, in this moment of quiet today, hold a mirror up to our lives. Hold a mirror up to our hearts. Lord, wherever compromise is present, oh God, bring us to our knees in repentance. So you talk to God today. Let's take a moment of just complete quiet. Whatever God points out to you, thank him for speaking honestly and just let him deal with it in your heart.
Jesus, you are the truth. You are life. You are resurrection, and we believe. We believe in you today, and therefore we receive the resurrection life that starts now and ends never. Thank you, Jesus, for your truth that is life-giving. Jesus, keep us in the center of your truth.